Hello, and welcome to this Clinical Insight case discussion on the diagnosis of IPF. My name is Dr. Merrill Kreider from the University of Pennsylvania. I would like to thank my esteemed panel for joining us today. The diagnosis of IPF requires a multidisciplinary approach involving pulmonology and radiology. While the characteristics of IPF by high-res CT are well-defined by international guidelines, recognition of more subtle features of IPF is often difficult. Furthermore, differentiation between IPF and other pulmonary fibrotic disorders is critical in order to assess the proper prognosis and course of treatment. For this discussion, we will be using a recent case of a 78-year-old. So this is a case of a 78-year-old woman with three years of progressive dyspnea and cough. Her past medical history is significant only for hyperlipidemia and hypertension. She has a small smoking history of one pack per day for five years, but quit 30 years ago. Her career has always involved working in offices, and she denies any significant pet, mold, hot tub, or bird product exposures. Her family history was negative for lung disease or autoimmune disease, and her review of systems was really remarkably negative in entirety. So we're going to start by uh, looking at her CT. So I'm going to show you a couple of different images here. This is the first one and the second and the third. All right. So with that history and this CT, what are the first few diseases you're beginning to think about? Well, she clearly has a lot of, of interstitial changes on her CT scan. Um, they're worse in the lower lobes, they're worse in the periphery. Um, so we know that she has interstitial lung disease causing her symptoms of cough and dyspnea. And the question becomes, is there a cause for this interstitial lung disease that we can identify, or is this going to be more of the one of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias? So I don't know, Jesse, what do you think in terms of her history? Are, are there things that, that we've identified so far, or, or what questions would you ask to, to try to probe her history you know, a little bit more detail to try to sort it out? I think at this stage you begin to think about the possibilities and obviously idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is in your differential. But you want to think about uh, potential environmental exposures and even though the history was negative for that, uh, we often find that as we continue to uh, ask more questions and be more detailed about the specific exposures that a patient can have, you begin to identify uh, other possibilities. So chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis is a possibility. Um, I'm quite intrigued about the pattern because, as you said, it is a pattern that is more predominant at the basis. There's significant uh, fibrosis, and you can begin to also think about prognosis independent sometimes of the, uh, of the ultimate diagnosis. You know, I think uh, in looking at the CT scan, it's important to point out that there's a decided asymmetry in the pattern, and the right lower lobe area shows a remarkable degree of clearing, particularly in the posterior basilar segments along the subpleural surface, which is a pattern that uh, is a little unusual for uh, UIP patterns of, of, of involving the eye. I think. I think the, the, this CT scan would definitely be a scan that would tend to move me away from at least a CT diagnosis of, of UIP uh, for, those, for that reason. Uh, the other thing that's, that's interesting is that you know, we worry about aspiration-induced lung injury, and again, uh, the clearing of the right posterior basilar segment uh, 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 would lead me away from that as probably a primary source of injury since uh, the right lower lobe is particularly prone, at least in the supine position, to, to that, type of, uh, that type of injury, of aspiration to injury. So this is a really very unusual uh, a CT scan appearance for interstitial lung disease. And, and I must admit, I, I'm, I'm quite baffled at this point as to what might be behind it, although I, you know, I agree it's obviously an interstitial lung disease. So, um. It's interesting that you're focusing on the difference, uh, because if you look at other images that she presented, um, you don't see that much of a difference. If this is an example of that where you see quite symmetrical approach. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure that I worry so much in this case. Certainly, if you have bilateral disease, you can have some yeah. dissociation uh, in, in some areas of the lung, but there's clearly significant involvement of both lungs here. What does, what does asymmetry make you think of? 
Well, it, it's, it's, it, I think asymmetry by itself is not uh, a, a diagnostic of anything. I mean, usually, you know, so, so if I were worried about aspiration injury, for example, I might expect to see more injury on the right side than the left side. I'm not seeing that here. It's just that at one image uh, where we, you know, we were looking at, particularly the posterior basal aspects, that, that clearing was just sort of an odd appearance for someone that I typically associate with this UIP, at least being able to make the diagnosis of UIP based on CT scan appearance. Now this particular image we're looking at now, again, has an unusual uh, aspect to it in my mind, and that is that, that uh, the posterior basal segments bilaterally seem to be less involved and is much more of a bronchiectasis and bronchiolocentric type pattern in the, in the uh, anterior segments. Again, uh, a pattern that doesn't allow me to say, for example, that this would be a UIP pattern based on CT scan appearance alone. Uh, now I want to emphasize that, that, that based on CT scan appearance alone because clearly there are ECT scans where we would say this is a very, very high likelihood this would be a UIP pattern. This is, in my estimation, not one of those types of CT scans. It looks uh, it, it looks very uh, uh, atypical for the typical CT scan pattern we, we would expect to see with UIP. So it's not so, that it could be UIP, but it's not the picture you'd put in a textbook to, exactly, to make exactly. an example of UIP. It, it doesn't, it, the CT scan by itself doesn't allow you to make that, that diagnosis. So if this woman came into your office now, what would you order next? So, so this is really the, the, the area that, uh, uh, that we probably would see the greatest of uh, variability uh, uh, because my, my goal would be to try to, uh, to uh, uh, study uh, her for secondary causes as, as vigorously as we could. And, and that usually in our, in our institution involves a very comprehensive approach to looking at oral immunity, uh, particularly uh, sh you know, diseases like Sjogren's syndrome, uh, you know, amyopathic myositis syndrome. She's completely asymptomatic. There's no family history. But nonetheless, we would look vigorously in this direction because, uh, you know, in a 78-year-old, uh, not having a diagnostic CT scan, my quest would be to avoid the question of surgical lung biopsy. Sure. And, uh, and we would be uh, uh, looking for, you know, rare antisynthetases. Uh, you know, we would really make it a, a real effort to see if we can identify a secondary cause because our suspicion is a little higher that, that a secondary cause is, is, is possible, mm -hmm. despite her advanced stage and despite the absence of any any symptoms that point to that. Besides uh, collagen vascular serologies, is there anything else you would test, you would order at this point? Well, we certainly need pulmonary function tests to look at uh, the intensity of or severity of her lung dysfunction. We would like to have a six minute walk test mm -hmm. to determine exercise tolerance, but also oxygenation. Mm -hmm. uh, so I certainly would like to see some of those. How about uh, uh, assessing her swallowing function? You brought up aspiration earlier. She's a 78-year-old woman. We tend to think of it as more common among the elderly. Do you routinely order swallowing assessments? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I also routinely look for evidence of esophageal dilatation or thickening on CT scan, which she doesn't have, but it doesn't exclude uh, 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 aspiration-induced lung injury. So I would look very, very carefully for that. You know, there are aspects of her CT scan that, that are not typical for aspiration-induced injury. The, relative spearing, for example, on this CT image of the left lower lobe, the relative spearing of the posterior basilar segments, you know, are not a typical pattern we see with aspiration induced lung injury, but nonetheless, I would certainly look uh, in that direction. And with the amount of fibrosis she has, you know, we all know that as fibrosis gets worse, uh, pleural pressure becomes more negative, intrathoracic structures, particularly air-filled structures, tend to dilate. That includes the esophagus. Uh, I, I, you know, we believe that esophageal dysmotility dismal, uh, dismal develops uh, uh, much, much more commonly with advancing fibrotic lung disease. So, so we do this as a matter of routine. We'll do a barium swallow to look at esophageal function and provocation for, for reflux type symptoms. So I think that's an important part of evaluation. Clearly the goal would be to try to get as close as we can to what uh, uh, what would be a comprehensive evaluation for secondary causes uh, so that we can avoid this question of IPF. Even though in her initial history it was stated that there's no birds or molds or hot tubs, you know, when I look at the CT scan with disease that starts pretty high up and, and as we've talked a lot about the distribution is a little bit funny, I'd really go back and, and probe that history uh, in a little bit more detail, talk to family members and, and just see is there something that
uh, that they haven't recognized that might be in their environment that's leading to this. You know, this has been going on for two to three years. You know, so there's something that's driving this slowly over time. I would like to hear from you guys. How, how often do you identify a formal cause of occupational ex or environmental exposure in patients who have chronic interstitial lung disease? Because in my experience, we often uh, do not identify a formal cause, even though we believe very strongly that there is an environmental or occupational cause of the disease. No, I, <clears throat> we rarely do. It's one of the prior biggest frustrations is, is, you know, there's nothing that we can identify in the history time, you know, on several visits, and we look at the CT scan and radiology says this is chronic hypersensitivity to pneumonia, and we can't find anything. And, and it, what that makes me worry about is in patients that we have a clear-cut exposure and we know that they have hypersensitivity to pneumonia, we know what the CT looks like, but we don't know if the CT looks like that without those exposures that it's because we're missing the exposure. Maybe idiopathic disease can also look like that. So we look hard, but we have a very similar experience to you in that, that most of the time when the differential strongly suggests by CT chronic hypersensitivity pneumonia, we're unable to find a cause. Yeah, I would even go further and say that even when we've confirmed the diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis by biopsy, uh, we rarely find a cause. <laughs> uh, um, it, it, it's a conundrum that even, uh, I think, affects how we approach them in terms of therapy. Uh, um, um, but, uh, but even when we are absolutely con uh, convinced, uh, even based on biopsy findings, we can't, uh, we can't find a cause. And I'd say that's probably more than 75% of patients. Yeah. How about the hypersensitivity panel? Does it help? I personally think it's worthless. <laughs> uh, I second that opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they, uh, they examine very limited amount of potential antigens. Positivity doesn't indicate disease, and the absence of a positive test doesn't indicate that the disease is not there. So uh, it's very difficult to think that they're very helpful. Do you send it? I typically don't. No. I, I rarely, rarely send one unless I'm, uh, I'm really uh, pushed to consider this in a very, very clear case where I know some of the antigens may be specific to the test we have. How about biopsy? You already mentioned that you would like to do everything you could not to biopsy her. Yes, yes. And Why? Well, you know, uh, uh, you know bi surgical biopsies today are, are done in most places with a minimally invasive approach. So that has dramatically reduced the comorbidities associated with surgical lung biopsies. I certainly trained in an era where uh, open lung biopsies were much more common. Uh, uh, so so I'm, I'm uh, at least delighted to be in an era now where we can do this with minimally invasive approaches, but nonetheless, uh, for a 70 or eight year old, it might be a difficult procedure to, to put a patient through. Um, so I would weigh the risk and benefit. I would, I obviously would never say never biopsy a 78 year old, but you certainly have to weigh the risk benefit uh, of a biopsy. Uh, the benefit obviously would be that if, if she doesn't have a UIP pattern on biopsy and, and for example we see evidence to support the diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis and that would prompt us to approach her in terms of therapy a little differently than if we were dealing with uh, a UIP pattern uh, and a diagnosis of IPF. So there, there's, there, there's information to be gained that might be useful but we have to do a risk-benefit analysis I think before considering it, particularly looking at comorbidities and the risk of surgery. I'm with Kevin. I, I would certainly not consider a surgical biopsy, but a number of organizations now have availability of cryobiopsies, which could be done as an outpatient ambulatory procedure. Uh, it provides a little larger uh, tissue for examination, although it's not been evaluated carefully for its uh, sensitivity and specificity. And, and it can be risky. We don't do cryobiopsies at our center, but when I talk to some of the centers that do do cryobiopsies, some of, it seems to me that some of the initial enthusiasm about how safe it is is a little bit more trepidatious now. Um, they can have significant bleeding. They're done in an OR setting. There's certainly less control than a, a surgical lung biopsy where you're, you're making a controlled incision. So, so I think it's a, a good point to consider, but I think you're, you're dead on in that we really don't know the test characteristics and the, the full safety procedure. And then you worry too, there's, you know, there's a few centers that are doing it that may develop excellent expertise, but as, if it disseminates, you know, are there gonna be more complications when people that aren't as trained uh, start doing those.
And we also don't have some information to help us make that decision in terms of her functional capacity, her breathing studies. I mean, we're looking at a chronological age of 78, but there's some 78-year-olds that are in great shape where you would have perhaps less trepidation in doing a biopsy, and there's sure. some 78-year-olds mm -hmm. that look like they're in their mid-80s. Sure. Sure. What patient characteristics would make you say, this is not someone I'm gonna biopsy? Uh, need for oxygen, severe uh, pulmonary dysfunction. She didn't have listed a lot of comorbidities, but you know, if she had had comorbidities, coronary disease, if she was obese, if she was more deconditioned, uh, any of those things would make me more nervous about putting her through a surgical procedure. I would add evidence of pulmonary hypertension yeah. also would be an important consideration. Do you have more basal or images on this CT scan? This is all we have. Okay. Oh, that's as basal as we get. The other thing that I think is important to, to highlight with some of the limitations and what we're struggling with the CT is, is all we have are a few cuts. And when you really are looking at these in, in the clinic setting, you, you have the advantage of being able to scroll up and down and look at all the images and really try to sort out, as you pointed out, how much of this is traction bronchiectasis versus uh, honeycombing. You know, and maybe we'd have a little bit more confidence one way or the other if we had the ability to look at all the images. You, know, you mentioned pulmonary hypertension. This particular image is really worrisome for, for that. Uh, she has a very large main uh, pulmonary artery trunk compared to the size of the aorta. So, so and you know, her disease appears, at least on the images we have, to be quite significant. So I, you know, I, I would start out with a great deal of concern about the presence of pulmonary hypertension, uh, just based on the CT scan appearance. And certainly a radiologist would call attention to that based on what we're seeing here with this image. So if you did, a, did an echocardiogram mm -hmm. and it did not show pulmonary hypertension, would you be concerned enough to do a right heart catheterization? Uh, good question, good question. I'd look for more physical findings, uh, maybe additional support. Uh, uh, we like uh, doing um, pro-BNP and uh, 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 although it's, you know, it's not been uh, absolutely validated for right-sided uh, uh, pressure elevations because uh, levels of pro-BNP are much lower, but, but I would certainly look for physical findings to support that. My inclination would be if she were, uh, if her pulmonary function test showed DLCOs are well below 30%, and she were hypoxemic, uh, had any signs of fluid retention, a, a slight elevation of BNP that I would almost certainly consider uh, doing a right heart cath. What are some of the most common errors you see when people come to you with CTs that have been sort of not, I wouldn't say misinterpreted, but perhaps overinterpreted in the community? So, so uh, you know, the most places that, uh, that refer to us are referred from you know, institutions that have pulmonologists that uh, look at CT scans. I, I think in, in reality, most pulmonologists in, in private practice rely heavily on the radiologist to, to steer them in, in interpreting CT scans. And so I, I, I can imagine a radiologist might say, this looks like a UIP pattern of fibrosis and a pulmonologist adopting that and not reviewing the CT scans themselves and, and, uh, uh, and, and act accordingly. So, so uh, uh, the first thing I would probably do is to communicate that I think there are many elements of the CT scan that don't allow us to make that, that, that assessment. And again, a vigorous search for secondary causes is really, I think, a critical part of her initial evaluation with the idea that if we can uncover something that allows us to avoid a surgical lung biopsy, uh, then that would certainly be uh, a good thing. Uh, but if we can't, then a surgical lung biopsy is certainly something that we would weigh the risk and benefit of, of, of proceeding with. I agree. I think the, a lot of us rely on the, the radiology interpretation. And I think when I look at the community radiology interpretation, it tends to be more broad in that, that I would expect an interpretation of this to say pulmonary fibrosis without the patterns of usual interstitial pneumonia or nonspecific interstitial pneumonia, not describing the features. Um, and so I think you can make a leap and say, oh, it's pulmonary fibrosis, and immediately think it's idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, when really what they're describing is just interstitial disease. So I think a lot of the, the community reads tend to be less descriptive than we might get at an academic center where they really describe all those features that we're looking for. What is the distribution? Is there honeycombing? Is there traction bronchiectasis, ground glass, et cetera? I suspect your experience is like mine that often what delays diagnosis is we get the patient with reports. Uh, they do not bring the actual CT images. Uh, 
Uh, and, and that sort of delays diagnosis because we then have to ask for the actual images so they can be reviewed by the radiologists, they can be reviewed by the pulmonologists. Um, and, and that is something we have to remind our referring physicians to please send all the information, including the imaging studies and echocardiography and so forth. And if they have histology to supply the slides, that's important. All right. Uh, well, this has been a very interesting discussion of this case. I think what I've heard from the panel is that we should think very carefully and examine uh, closely the characteristics of the CTs ourselves and not rely on the reports. And when appropriate, think about best ways to investigate uh, for secondary causes of scarring of the lung uh, before moving on and assuming either that we need a biopsy or that uh, um, uh, we should label this as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis.